Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Today on the Sikh spectrum, we've come to um, Judge Mota Singh's house, who have kindly let us um, come into their house and allowed us to interview them. So I think most people would know who Judge Mota Singh is, but those that don't, I should just point out a couple of things that I, um, in talking to them, that I had discovered. First of all, that they were the first Sikh judge that wore a turban in 1967. They uh, became um, the judge in 1982. And since then, in 2010, they were also knighted. So they've become Sir uh, Mortasing, not just judge in the front of them. And of course, they are a QC. So let's uh, first uh, introduce ourselves from the Sikh spectrum. So, uh, <coughs> Judge Mortasing, Wai Guru Ji Ka Khalsa. Wai Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wai Guru Ji Ka Khalsa. So, Judge, let me first start by asking you um, some questions about your um, uh, bachpan, where, where you grew up. I, I know it was in, in Kenya. Yes. Maybe you can shed some light about your background education. Well, uh, as you just pointed out, I was born in Kenya, the eldest of uh, six children. And my youngest brother was then six months old when my father died. As I was, I was only 16. And I was still at school. Uh, in the final year of, of the school, and the question arose whether I should continue to receive education or, or leave the school and take up a job and provide for the family. My grandfather was still there, and uh, but the decision was taken that I should spend another year, which I and I'm very glad that I did, because that provided the basic education that I needed. I, I required in order to go further. So there it is, born in Kenya, Nairobi. Uh, went to this local school, Indian uh, high school there, and then joined the Sikh Union Club, played cricket for, for the club and also for Kenya, um, uh, against the Redeen Stragglers at, and a team from South Africa. And uh, that was until 1954, when I joined, the, joined Lincoln's Inn um, in, in London in order to read for the bar and came here in 1954 and stayed, spent a couple of years here to keep the terms as, they were, uh, as it is known as, keep the terms, called to the bar, and back to Kenya to practice as a lawyer. Ah, fascinating. I had, I had one question for you. So you were a cricket player. Were you, what, I mean, that, you didn't take it, at a, I mean, you were a professional cricket player. No, no, not professional. No, we were, none of us were professional, just an amateur. We played on every Saturday and every Sunday. Uh, for, for the club, we, we we used to have some, some good good matches uh, among not only among the Asian teams but also the Europeans and the and the Asians and the, and the, the local test matches is known as against the Europeans and the Asians and the officials and the unofficials. It, it was a great life, I know it is. Right, and did you always wanted to be? Was it something in your family that you wanted to go into law, or was that your first choice, or did you naturally go to the bar? Oh, not at all. Far from it. My in, uh, ambition had always been to, to, to be a doctor. And that was what my father also wanted me to do. But I've just pointed out that because he died, and uh, that put paid to my ambition to, to become a doctor. And then I had, after a year, further year at school, I had to leave school, take up a job, and uh, look after my younger brother, the siblings. And my grandfather was also there, and he was in work. So the two of us got together and provided for the, for the family. I uh, became um, a, a lawyer almost by, by accident, accident in the sense this, that um, the, during the war, uh, the Inns of Court had introduced a, a practice which enabled anyone who wanted to read for the bar to do the local exa the examination locally in their own countries and to come here for a limited period, to come to England for a limited period. And I took advantage of that, as did quite a lot of other people, advantage of that, joined Lincoln's Inn, and did my first part of the examination in Nairobi, and came to England, uh, and as I said, in 1954, for a couple of years, spent a couple of years here, and uh, passed the examinations, well, neither with glory nor with ignominy, but passed them, I dare say, and went back to Kenya in, in uh, February, April 1956 to set up my practice uh, as, a, as an advocate. And that I did, and I was sort of the first in the family uh, to, uh, to be a professional, have a professional degree, and to be a professional man. 
Of course, I have, everything started from there. I now have uh, two brothers who are in the legal profession. One is a chartered accountant. The other fifth one is uh, the airport manager at Charles de Gaulle Airport in, in Paris. And I have two sons. One is a de dental surgeon in Harley Street. And the other one is in business and a very, very successful um, chap. And... Uh, and there it is. Right. No, that's, that's fascinating, I think. One of the things that I did want to pick up was that you've, um, so you, you wanted to, I mean, it must be the thing about most Sikh families, guess, Sardinian, a doctor, bun, but obviously everybody cannot become a doctor. In your circumstances, it was somewhat different. But what, um, when you did become a judge, I remember, I remember there's a cartoon in the newspaper where somebody behind the dock is saying to you, like, I hope that your head gets better. What did you feel about becoming the first judge wearing a turban? Oh, that, it, it was a great honor, uh, really, for the first one to have been in a history of, according to one of the newspapers, uh, going back about 300 years, that is the first time in 300 years that a member of the bar, first of all, that had appeared in courts wearing a turban and not, a, not a, the barrister's wig, and to be appointed to the bench uh, again uh, it, it was it was amazing, as something I never dreamed of, never thought that would that would that would happen. But I do remember now. I recall uh, sometimes when I go over the period, so some of my British lawyer friends, barrister friends, used to say, "Mota, we know that you one day you will end up on the bench in this country. When that happens, will depend very much largely on largely on you. If you don't blot your copybook, you will go far." And, uh, and I stayed along the, raw, the, the, the thin and the narrow <laughs> line and uh, comported myself in a manner which I thought was expected of me as a judicial, member of the judiciary. And, uh, and I was well received, received by the judges uh, with great enthusiasm and with great affection. And when I retired uh, about several years ago, the Lord Chief Justice of England himself came to the court at the valediction and, uh, and congratulated me for my contribution to the, uh, to the judicial process, judicial machinery, and, the, and various other matters. And it was a great, a great to see that. So is it, and then I know that in 2010 that you were knighted. So how does um, one get knighted then? Is it for the work that they've done, mm. voluntary sector or in the law? I mean, did someone recommend you? Well, so, 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 so someone needs to be recommended to, to be one's name to be put forward uh, to the cabinet office. Now, that was done. I don't know who did it. Uh, no, no idea. And I know, didn't know that it had been done. Not until one fine Friday morning, I received a buff-colored uh, envelope from the... Uh, the cabinet office, and I was a little scared in opening it up, but I, I did, and there it was, the the notification that the uh, that the decision had been taken to award the knighthood to knighthood to me, and I was uh, asked strictly not to breathe a word of it to anyone, not for six months until the official announcement. I mean, this was in July of, of 2009, not for six months to keep mum o over it. And the only person who knew was my wife. I didn't even tell my children about it. Oh. And just in that case, the thing got out. So it was not until the day before the f official announcement on the 1st of January 2010 that I, that I told him. By then, of course, the whole thing had been made public. Right. I do want to talk about one, um, uh, not an incident, but where you were invited to the U.S. Embassy. Uh, to talk about and, and the, um, <coughs> about the war and so on, and um, in the papers it was picked up. Not that you were controversial, but you had made some comments about that it was an illegitimate policy on terrorism. And I wanted to know how does that when they invited you? Do you? I mean, what is the process behind? Oh the, no, the I, 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 I think I can, I can explain that. Uh, that was the Versailles pr program celebrated for the, first, for the first time in the American embassy. And, uh, and the ambassador had been told that I would be one of the speakers. And we and the, and the couple of other people who spoke at the, at the function, they had to submit copies of their speeches before 
so that they, the high commission knew, the, the ambassador rather, knew exactly what Kumpon was going to say. And I had submitted my copy of the speech to him, and, uh, it, and um, no eyebrows were raised, no objections were raised to what I said, but I never said anything of the sort. I think the whole thing was mis misreported. I still have the original of the, of the speech, uh, and of course the ambassador and their staff were quite happy with that. Right. Yeah, I can. It seemed really odd, but I, I thought it was quite petty that the papers like to pick up stories or uh, rumors or you know where they can get some some sort of um, uh, you know dirt on someone. Was the whole idea about it rather than actually reporting what was written? Yeah. Um, let's let's move on to the role that you have with um, your local gurdwara. I mean, your local gurdwara is Southfields, and uh, I wanted to ask you about. One thing um, about the role that you play, and maybe you can explain why is it that a lot of professional people don't actually um, go into Gurdwara management committees. Although I do know that Southfield's Gurdwara has been known as Kijie Pare Lehi Anda Gurdwara. That's a phrase that people use. So, what is your role in it at the moment? Well, I've been associated with that Gurdwara for ever since its inception, about 40, 45 years now. And it was started by uh, the Sikhs from, from Nairobi, from Kenya. And all of them were uh, uh, either in, in work in the civil service or uh, um, in, in the, the banks and, uh, and, uh, or in business or something of that nature. They were all people who, had, who were, had been, who were educated, had been educated in Kenya before they came. Or some of them, of course, went to school or to the universities here. And uh, so we all dis decided to set up a, uh, a Gurdwara here. And we bought a piece of land with an old uh, uh, a light industrial use building there and converted it in into the temple. Now, of course, we have a beautiful new temple here. And uh, so I've been associated with it ever, ever since its, its, its inception. What we have done now, because of the shortage of people uh, who are willing to come forward to participate in the in the running of of the, of the guru, gurdwaras? I think every gurdwara finds that. I mean, at, we we have elections uh, once every year, and we f we found that every year there was always it's the same people who were elected to the to the management, either one group one year and the next second group uh, the, the the following year, and it was very unsatisfactory. And as we thought that we would change, uh, change things and decided to amend the constitution so instead of providing for elections every, every year, we thought that we would have a board of management who would run the Gurdwara with the chairman and, uh, and four other members of the, of the management. I want to move on to the pamphlet that you have, which is called The Sikhs, that you wrote in 1998. And when I read some parts of it, I was quite surprised at how in 1998 you had made some comments about the youth and, and the way to move forward. I was wondering whether you could share some of that um, discussion that we were having. What I said in 1988 was, uh, this was a, a, a lecture that I delivered uh, to one of the institutions which was attended by a very large, large number of, of people. And it was the... the did the year before the 1999 celebrations. And I thought I'd take that opportunity to put forward some some my views. And I said, clearly the 300th anniversary of the founding of the Khalsa in 1999 is a momentous occasion for the Sikhs. It is not only an occasion to celebrate, it is much more than that. It is an occasion to take stock, to indulge in a bit of introspection to see how we, the present day Sikhs, measure up to the vision of Guru Gobind Singh. And I remind myself of the principles of our faith, principles for which our Guru stood and some of them sacrificed all they had. And at no period in our recent history have these principles been greater in need of being observed without question and than now. But then, and then I went on to say, and you see this is almost a prescient remark to made in 1998 uh, and we are now talking in 2012 that but I regret to have to observe 
that we are living in a period of disintegration of faith and growing disillusionment about the traditional values which have come down to us. Many pernicious practices against which our gurus revolted have crept into Sikh society. Worldly considerations are corrupting the great ideals. The barriers which the gurus labor to cast down have been recreated and our society is more, most, more caste ridden now than at any other time in our history. We only pay lip service to these ideals. We observe merely the trappings of religion, the gestures of faith and the conventions of piety. And there is a difference between our belief and, and our behavior. Our actions do not match our words. Now those were my sentences at the time and they and I think they have been proved almost over, over the period. That is still the position. And, uh, and I, how do we cope with that? How do we stop people, certainly our youth, uh, from, uh, because that's one of the dangers, the increasing indifference of our youth to religion and its practice. How do we cope with that? How do we stop them from straying from the Guru's path? And because do not forget that we are in competition with a whole lot of other agencies apart from the zealots of other religions that influence our youth as indeed the use of other, uh, other communities, such as uh, the media, the schools, their workplace, the various influence, the place of work, and so on. How do we prevent our youth, if we can, from being adversely influenced by what they see around them with the inevitable conflicts that arise in their minds? How do we inculcate in them the feeling the conviction that they are the inheritors of great religion and great traditions, that they can and should be able to combine their everyday life with a life lived in accordance with the tenets of their faith. I mean, this is something that I have been able to do. I'm complying with the tenets of my faith and yet also being a full-fledged part of the, of the community of the society here. Yes, and but, but I would assume that there are very few people, um, Judge Mota Singh, in your position that are playing a role in the community and at the same time doing their you know, day-to-day -day work, what you did, and still played a, a major role, I think, in, 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 the, in the community. That's far and... Uh, you well, know. This is something that was instilled in us, the, the whole family instilled us by, uh, by our parents. That's why it very, very depends very largely on, on, on how we behave. We set ourselves as models for our children. The children are, are, a, are a clever lot, our, our children. They will, if they have questions, we should be able to answer those questions. They will not just accept merely what you tell them. Of course, you model your own lives in accordance with your tenets. If you do that, then your children will, children will follow that. So the whole thing was instilled in, into us by our, by our parents. And, uh, and, and uh, of course, going to the Gurdwara, which we did quite regularly, even now we do regularly. Um, we don't have to do that because we, you're, not, you're not there every day, seven days a week. You're there only on two days, the Southfield ones, and every Wednesday and every Saturday. But then we, because I'm an Amaradari seat, I recite my five banis or six banis every day and uh, as I'm required to do. But not only because I'm required to do, because I, this is something I want to do. I, if I don't do it, I feel that there's something missing. So, so do you think maybe the children growing up here, we're not sort of instilling into them those core values that, that the Sikhs should uphold? I think that is largely, largely the case. And of course, when there, as I mentioned, competition from other agencies, of course our youth are subject to what they see around them, what they, uh, they go around in, in the school, they come across people of other religions, other faiths. And with, but it, it, it's, it's quite hard for children growing up here when the media, the music, the dressing is very different, you know, and when you try to tell them these things, they sort of think that maybe it's old-fashioned, that we don't, we want to mix with, 
um, our friends and so on. It, it's not an easy place. It's not an easy place. It, it, it's a tremendous responsibility uh, that, that we have, the parents, and also responsibility from the youth also, because they must understand uh, that, you see, you, it is not for us to change the rules of the, of the game. Our rules have been laid down by our gurus. It is not for us to change them. We have to live uh, by those rules, live according to those rules. And we are able to do that, if we are able to do that. If some of us are able to do that, there's no reason why all of us aren't able to do that. That is why the Guru, Guru Gobind Singh Ji envisaged every Sikh becoming an Amardhari Sikh. If everyone did that, th you would, uh, although some of us mentioned that you mentioned, you mentioned the incident in, in um, the Rakabhanga Gurdwara. I'm sure, I, I'm quite no doubt that the people involved were Amardhari Sikhs. But uh, there you are, that is a, a misuse if I may use the word uh, without getting into trouble, a, a misuse of one's position as an Amardhari Sikh, resorting to the, the use of the Kirpan and, and so on. Okay, so what do you think the future holds for Sikhs here in the UK? I think the, the, the future, sometimes there is a time when I wondered, will we, the Sikhs, have Sikh grandchildren? Will there be the Sikh grandchildren in the way that we see them now, we know them now? And I came to the conclusion, yes, Sikhs have, the, the, the Sikh religion has been assaulted, has been assaulted for centuries, and yet it has always come up, it has always withstood those assaults, always risen up, and it may be left to a handful of people, but nevertheless, that is the case. Sikhi is not going to die. It will remain there for the rest of, rest of time. That is what the Guru's word is to us. If we, if we abide by what the Guru said, we cannot go wrong. We will only go wrong if we do not accept what the Guru It's not a question of blind faith. You can argue it out. You can challenge the, 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 the people, challenge the youth if they want to argue with you. Yes, get into an argument with them. Try and convince them by, by your argument. Not by simply saying, this is because I do, the way you should do it. No. Convince them by argument and you can do that. No, I think it's true. I think what you've said is, um, you know, I, the problem that I have is I, I, I quite like arguing on every aspect of the Sikh faith. So for me, it's quite natural to argue with people. Yeah. But I think you're right. The, the time has gone where he would question, <coughs> we have to have reasons and explain to them properly rather than get the, you know, your parents were saying it. Um, so I, I think that, you know, with that, um, is there anything else that you'd like to add? I think just one say, I think we can't always blame other people for our ills. We must put our own house in order, and that is of the utmost importance. Importance, Put our own house in, in, in order, and, uh, and we can always get some guidance from, from, uh, from our religion and so on. I think the need of the hour is for enlightened men with a clear vision men of discipline steeped in the maryada men with a spiritual depth not caring uncaring bigots above all men of moral courage who will stand like a rock who will speak to our deep instinct that there's more to life than self-indulgence personal power opposition that modern culture seems not only to expect and condone but encourage men who understand the community's problems anxieties, needs, predilections, men who are alive to the community's problem, to the challenges to the community and have the ability and courage to articulate those fears and its aspirations and to set their faces like flint against any vociferous tendency to identify and define the goal for the community. Very important for the leaders to define the goal for the community. How should the community comport itself, talking about a country like, like England, a multiracial, multi-religious, multicultural community. How do we, 
who are living our lives in accordance with our faith. How do we combine that with with life in this country, taking part in every sort of activity? Well, I want to thank Judge Murta Singh for sharing their views. I would recommend the Gurdwaras to get this pamphlet regarding which they had written in uh, 1998 on the Sikhs, and uh, I'm more than happy through the Sikh channel to distribute them. So um, with that, I want to thank you very much for sharing your views with us. Thank so um, hopefully I will see you at the next Sikh Spectrum. Mm-hmm. Thank you.